you have so many di so many dire stories about fishing that I wondered where the fish were going to come from to feed the world. And it didn't take too long to figure out where the fish were going to come from to feed the world. They're going to come from farm fish. Because now, uh, at least this is probably an old figure, but a uh, few years ago, it was 52% of the fish eaten in the world are farmed. And the majority of the farmed fish are freshwater, uh, mostly in Asia. Um, my book, uh, The Blue Revolution, focuses on um, the marine environment. And it's really about the transformation of fishing in the 21st century. And of course, fishing means wild hunting and um, farming. Um, so anyway, so uh, aquaculture since the mid 80s has started um, accelerating. It's now um, bigger than capture fishing. And we'll, that trend will probably continue. Um, <clears throat> I focus this book mostly on New England where I grew up and um, the Gulf of Maine and George's Bank are legendary fishing grounds. And, um, you know, since 1000 AD when the Basques from Spain were all over here that uh, there's been um, cod fishing, um, which has kind of <laughs> been stopped in the last 20 years due to um, overfishing. So anyway, I, as I started writing this book, I, from a f food perspective, not necessarily from a fisherman's perspective or a fishing perspective, but where are the food gonna, where's the food gonna come from? Um, I called it the blue revolution because there was initially in the sixties and seventies, a green revolution, which focused on, um, improving yields of grain and wheat in Asia uh, through fertilizers and crop rotation and irrigation and so forth. And uh, it saved by any account one to two billion people from um, starvation, incredibly successful. And then in the 80s, there was, an, there was something called the Blue Revolution, which started in India and it was freshwater aquaculture. And so there was the same hope that the blue revolution might do for fish what the green revolution had done for grain and rice. Um, so I have taken that and expanded it from Asia to the West or the entire world, the idea of the blue revolution and expanded it from uh, freshwater to marine. Um, and some of the things I found when I was researching this book, well, I started out with the uh, with the realization that most people, most Americans, have very negative perceptions about fishing and fish farming. They think it's bad. They think it's overdone. They think it's dirty. It's environmentally bad and so forth. But I was seeing um, a different side of the coin, that there was a lot, lot of new things happening, a lot of changes in the last 20 years or so. Um, and of course, um, most of them, and also a lot of new people coming into the industry, because you think about fishing, you think of rusty old boat, boats and grizzled old men, but there are a lot of uh, women, there are a lot of very young people, there are a lot of scientists, there are a lot of entrepreneurs coming into the fishing industry, and there's even private investment coming into the industry, which is unusual. Um, and that's really largely because of um, the aquaculture and the farm side of, of, of fishing. Um, although even wild hunting now, given the concern for the ocean, is attracting a lot more attention. Um, so I started out... Um, Hold on one sec, I'm just going through my slides. So I can't, I can't show you these slides. So some of the stuff I looked at were um, uh, aquaponics, the combination of aquaculture and hydroponics. If you take the fish water from raising fish and filter it through greenhouses and stuff, you can grow, grow greens. Um, also uh, multi-trophic multi -trophic farming where you have um, uh, fed species with extractive species like seaweed, scallops, shellfish. So you're cleaning the water as um, 
as you're you're fishing. Um, and seaweed, of course, is soaking up nitrogen and, and carbon. Um, but as I say, the um, the change in fishing really began in 1976 when we went from the two, 12 mile limit to the 200 mile limit. And it was the act of Congress, the Magnuson-Stevens Act that um, established the principle of maximum sustainable yield that we would, you could fish as much as you want as, as long as you left enough in the water to sustainably yield year after year after year. And that um, regulation, which has been updated twice, has really made the US fisheries a model for much of the world. And, um, and this is in spite of the fact that there obviously was a, a bit of a, a um, miscalculation with the cod fishing. Uh, one of the things that happened actually is when the foreign ships were pushed offshore in the mid seventies, there was a lot of government, US government subsidies that came in to uh, upgrade the fishing fleet, the US fleet. So newer boats, faster boats, bigger boats. And during the eighties, there was intense fishing and that really led to the kind of demise of the cod in the nineties. The uh, Magnuson-Stevenson Stevens Act was um, uh, rewritten in 2006, and it changed the way um, fisheries are managed. Uh, it used to be kind of like a days at sea regime. You could you could fish, you know, 170 days, and it went down to 150 and 60 and 40 and so forth. <clears throat> In 2010, they switched to a quota system and it's been very successful, although much more successful for the fish, for protecting the fish than for the livelihoods of the fishermen. So the quota system is based on um, establishing a count for a, the size of any given stock, cod or haddock or squid or pollock or uh, any kind of whitefish. And then saying the sustainable yield of that is 30%. So you say a million metric tons, we can take out 30%. And then they allocated quotas to fishing boats with permits based on that um, um, sustainable yield. And it has been very effective in um, maintaining the, the sustainability of the various species. The only problem with it is that it has basically the quotas have basically gone to established older fishermen and it's much, much harder for younger fishermen to get into the game. And um, so I think that's a policy correction that needs needs to happen. Um, but for example, there were 47 fish stocks in, 2000, in, in the year 2000 that were closed to overfishing. And then 40, uh, 47 of all the stocks, there were like 50 something, 47 of all the stocks that were closed have been reopened to fishing. There are more ground fish now uh, in the water than there were 20 or 30 years ago, even with cod and some flounder in distress. So these are things I don't think people know. They just think that all the fish are disappearing and uh, fisheries are badly managed and um, that really isn't the case. And it's not just the US, it's many parts of Europe. Uh, it's New Zealand, Australia, uh, even countries like Philippines and Indonesia have really changed. There's a, uh, you know, I'd say 70%, 80% of the world has really made uh, major shifts. And the, one, of the, one of the next major shifts is gonna be in, um, you know, transparency of where the fish are coming from. Uh, because now uh, globally, sea, seafood fraud is like, you know, 30 or 40 percent of the seafood you see is mislabeled, either unintentionally or intentionally. Uh, so this has led to a big push for, you know, blockchain traceability and other means of um, transparency. And the FDA has ruled that by 2025, all fish sold in the U.S., whether caught here or uh, imported must be um, uh, 
subject to tech enabled traceability. Uh, and that is really largely to restrict illegal catch and especially things like um, farmed shrimp from uh, parts of Asia that is from kind of very dirty farms. Um, and now the only regulation on imported fish, it must say um, country of origin. They just say import of Thailand, but it tells you nothing about what you're seeing. So now the uh, the fish auctions in Gloucester and New Bedford, which are obviously very big ports, um, fishing ports, Port of New Bedford is the number one value port in the country, has been for 20 years, mainly because of scallops. Uh, the auctions there are all using um, blockchain tracing, um, you know, from the fish that when it's dropped off and sold and put into the distribution system. Uh, one of the issues with sustainable fishing is, um, so I'm switching gears a little bit here, to, moving aside, flipping the coin from the fishing side, the production side to the consumption side. Uh, there's a great um, seafood chef turned seafood, sustainable seafood advocate named Barton Seaver. And he says, there is nothing unsustainable about seafood. What's unsustainable is consumer demand. And what he's talking about is that what Americans are eating primarily, 60% of what Americans eat is shrimp and salmon that's farmed on the other side of the world, tuna that's caught on the other side of the world, when in fact the United States has the second largest ocean territory in the world after France. So there's a big push to uh, advocate for, promote more um, consumption of local species, which are by definition more sustainable. I mean, if you have the right quotas on them, of course, but they're here, they're not coming in by airplane from the other side of the world. So there's been a big local catch movement it's some 20 years, I would say, behind the agriculture local catch or cons um, con consumer supported aquaculture, uh, agriculture CSA. But now there are a lot of um, CSFs, com community supported fisheries, where you can buy um, <clears throat> local fish from local fishermen. And I think what this is doing, and, and also there are fish shops that are, are cropping up that are doing the same thing, is increasing the connection between the producer and the consumer. Because fishermen, by and large, have been very um, um, remote, inaccessible creatures. They just go to sea, they live at sea, they don't like land, they don't have any respect for landlubbers. There's a disconnect. Um, but I think this this connection, this um, local catch movement is really, really changing that. Um, the other thing that's really changed or changing is uh, quality fish used to be con associated with fresh fish. You know, your nice fresh piece of fish is high quality. Well, in fact, fresh piece of fish may have been on a boat for 10 or 14 days before it even gets into the distribution chain. Uh, frozen fish was used to con be considered, you know, commodity freezer, second rate stuff. But now with flash freezing techniques where you can flash in some cases on the boat or immediately when it's um, landed, uh, it's locking in freshness. And often it tastes better and it certainly travels better than fresh fish. And so this has opened up a whole nother um, um, segment in the fish industry of, you know, prepackaged fish like Luke's lobster meat, um, Sitka, Sitka salmon from Sitka, Alaska, um, all, kind, all kinds of stuff that will travel now and maintain its um, freshness and um, um, protein much, much better than it used to. Another um, Another trend in as that I see as part of the blue revolution is the, the um, using the entire fish in general. When fish is processed, forty percent of the fish is you know the bones, head, everything is just tossed. So now there is there are movements to to use all the, the so many of the those materials um, to produce other products that are higher value. 
uh, well, not higher value, which create more value for the fish. So instead of just getting a couple of fillets, now in Iceland, is a they're creating cod and mackerel, I mean, cod and salmon skin wallets. Um, they're creating out of cod skin, very sophisticated um, um, bandages for diabetic wounds and uh, breast reconstruction and so forth. And these cod skin bandages, uh, you can get eight of them from one codfish worth about $4,000 um, are being used by the Pentagon and hospitals all over the world. Uh, there's another movement to process more uh, um, with more intention. And there's a, there's a technique in Japan called ikejame, which is um, kind of a quick kill and quick bleed. And it you know comes from the sushi uh, industry. But that is being used now in the coast of Maine. And it's being used in a lot of the um, um, farm fish that are raised in tanks, which I'll get to in a second. So these these are there are there are a lot of trends um, that are really changing the industry. You know the new people coming in, the the multitrophic growing different uh, um, species together, using the fish water for uh, to grow vegetables, um, uh, using other parts of the fish, uh, freezing it rather than um, s selling it fresh. Um, tracing it instead of just turning it into a commodity product. And again, you know, I mentioned the connection between producer and consumer, but a lot of that tr traceability and blockchain is being used to profile the fishermen in the boat. Where did this fish come from? Who caught it? Where and when and how? And that, again, just is 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 um, strengthening the connection between the consumer and um, the uh, producer. <laughs> Um, as I said, you know, a lot of this is a lot of the um, kind of 100% um, utilization uh, push is coming out of Iceland. There's an Iceland ocean cluster, um, which has been going since 2010 or 11. And it has spawned similar clusters uh, in the U.S. There's one in Portland, Maine, New Bedford, Mass, New Haven, Connecticut, uh, Anchorage, Alaska, um, Washington State somewhere. And basically is putting incubators on the docks uh, of businesses that are trying to figure out how to use fish in different ways or fish products in different ways. Um, so, you know, a lot of that is also seaweed. So it's not even a fish product, but it's obviously a marine product. And um, now the, the, you know, this is an ancient, ancient um, um cultivated edible, but it's new in the U.S. And um, it's becoming increasingly popular, especially with people like, say, fishermen and lobstermen in um, Maine. In winter, you know, they're not lobstering, but now they're they've, they're running uh, seafood operations. Um, Okay, so that is on the wild side. So on the, on the on the farm side, um, here are a couple of um, factoids about the farm side. Aquaculture, as I said earlier, is the gra fastest growing form of food production in the world, and mariculture or marine aquaculture is the fastest growing form of aquaculture. Uh, if you look at the NOAA Northeast Territory, which is um, uh, Cape Hatteras up to the Bay of Fundy, the number one um, catch is lobster, the number two is scallops, and the number three is farmed fish. It's mostly shellfish, almost entirely shellfish uh, with some seaweed. Um, and so when you think about um, aquaculture, and this is true in most of the world, that 70% of the aquaculture is shellfish and seaweed. And so, you know, there's a lot of complaints about the dirty farming techniques, and they do exist, though they've been improving. But shellfish, by definition, are good for the environment, good for the ocean. They filter out toxins from the water, and they improve the water quality. So that's 
one big thing to think of with um, aquaculture, that it's driven by shellfish and seaweed, and both are very good for the water. Seaweed taking absorbs carbon dioxide, which uh, helps shellfish grow because it um, the acidification of carbon is bad for the shell building of uh, shellfish. Uh, so there's a nice symbiosis there. Um, the other thing in aquaculture, the other big movement is this for fin fish or fish that swim as opposed to shellfish. <laughs> um, fin fish farming is using um, land-based tanks rather than doing these farms offshore or near shore where they were worried about environmental degradation of the water, uh, uh, escapement of fish, um, sea lice, and all these things that were a problem in the 90s in Norway. There's been a movement started out of Norway and now growing very fast in the US to grow fish in tanks on land in recirculating aquaculture systems. And you know, it gives um, fish farmers um, much more control. Uh, it's a very energy intensive business. You've got thousands and thousands of gallons of tanks and many tanks often in the same farm. Um, you, uh, that you need to keep at certain temperatures, certain salinity. It's very high tech, very energy intensive, but the water is, is, is recirculated and cleaned and reused by and large. So it's not wasting water. You get, it has 95 to 98% uh, recirculating and reuse. Um, so that is now just in New England alone, there's Branzino Farms, which is a uh, Mediterranean bass, is a Barramundi, which is an Asian kind of uh, bass, Australia, Asia. Um, there are eel farms and um, increasingly salmon farms. So, you know, the, the, the big, the holy grail, of course, is salmon because it's like basically the number one fish that Americans like. Uh, and so a lot of Norwegian companies are trying to grow it here so they don't have to ship it from overseas. Um, so that is a huge um, um, new trend. And um, the only thing I will say about that, the only downside to these huge recirculating aquaculture systems is that they are very high tech. There are a lot of moving parts and a lot can go wrong. And if they, if they fail, you can lose a lot of fish fast. So it's something that, you know, these things have attracted a lot of investment and investors are really watching to see if they can figure out how to perfect the, uh, the system. Um, so the other piece, so I talked about the seaweed. The other thing that's happening with the seaweed is um, because people aren't used to eating seaweed is that there's a whole you know, many or cottage industry of people figuring out how to use it. It's now being served as kelp balls in um, public schools, some places, uh, kelp burger. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the New Yorker some years ago had a story about growing seaweed and had a great line. It said, kelp is the culinary equivalent of the electric car. And that is a reference to the its carbon absor absorption uh, capability, a property that I alluded to earlier. Um, okay, hold on one sec. So one thing about, you know, I talked about the, you know, all the kind of negative perceptions of fish farming and, you know, dating, I think really to, um, you know, salmon farming in Norway in the nineties and a little bit to, shrimp farming in Asia over the last 20 years. Um, but this recirculating stuff is so much cleaner. And a lot of the companies are now using that as a, to sell the attributes um, of the fish. You know, they say this RAS, R-A-S technology is home, hormone-free, chemical-free fish. Uh, they say um, no mercury, no microplastics, no antibiotics, no artificial dyes, 100% traceable. So all these things are uh, being used as a way of selling to a skeptical uh, consumer um, 
that this is a fresh local fish harvested for you by a fish farmer in your state. Um, steelhead, that's the other one. There's a, there's a, there's a good steelhead farm in uh, Hudson, New York. Uh, I don't know about Pennsylvania, Delaware, where you guys are, but there's, um, there's got to be fish farms down there. Um, okay. Um, so <clears throat> the fish farm um, story is that they've moved from near shore farms to land-based farms, but the, the holy grail <clears throat> for a lot of farmers or businesses is to go way offshore. So you, you're away from the, you know, kind of you're in deep water, you're in colder water, you get more currents. So it's cleaning all the fish poop and stuff. It's not soiling the bottom. Uh, and Norway and China are really leaps and bounds ahead of the U.S. on this. Um, you know, the U.S., for all its water, ocean territory, is 17th in the world in aquaculture. It really lags behind. And um, anyway, so now Norway and China are doing building things that are like oil rigs way offshore that are actually salmon farms. And that, you know, with remote control on land and and um, so forth. And it's been difficult to ask impossible, I should say, or it hasn't happened yet, to get any of these farms approved, permitted. Uh, so state U.S. state waters go, or go out three miles, and then three miles out to 200 miles is considered federal water. And federal water is, the fisheries are more or less controlled by NOAA, the um, Oce Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association. But when it comes to that's the wild side, but on the on the farm side, uh, the USDA, the FDA, NOAA, Army Corps of Engineers is involved. There, there are at least six agencies, and it's almost impossible to get a permit to start an offshore fish farm in the United States. There have been efforts in Congress going back 20 or almost 20 years to simplify the paperwork and the permitting process, and it has never worked. Um, okay, so th that's wild fishing and uh, fish farming. And I'll just finish with a few of the kind of um, um, challenges that the world still faces in fishing. As I said, you know, there's been, you know, leaps and bounds, uh, huge improvements made in, in policy and oversight. Um, but illegal fishing uh, is still a big problem, and that is mostly in the open ocean, which is not controlled by any country. Um, and in some places, it's it's um, happening on uh, within other countries' territorial waters by um, Chinese squid fishermen, um, and the countries either in South America or Af Africa don't have enough control or oversight to control it. Um, so there is a lot of illegal fishing being done. And that's one reason why that whole tech-enabled traceability um, uh, has, has um, been instituted or to take place in 2025. Um, and along with the illegal fishing, there's a lot of, you know, um, um, you know, um, what do you call it, um, you know, ship slaves that are captured on boats for two years at a time. So it's a kind of dirty, nasty business. Uh, and there's, a, there's an outfit called the um, Global Fishing Watch, which uses um, uh, international um, navigation data and also uh, satellite data and radar data to apprehend and indict and convict some of this, but the ocean is so huge and so and um, so impossible to um, and no one really it belongs to everyone the open ocean that's 60 percent of the ocean is open ocean not belonging to any country um, so that is a huge problem that is being addressed through technology more and more but there's still a long way to go the other major problem, as you probably well know, is um, climate change. 
Um, the ocean is warming at an alarming rate and um, warmer water holds less oxygen, which means that fish are going to have to adapt and get smaller and probably go toward the poles further north, further south. Uh, the other issue with warming water is that it uh, is creating kind of a dense um, barrier of warm water that is not allowing the cold water and the nutrients to be pumped up from the bottom of the ocean. And those nutrients are key to feeding the phytoplankton, which is a microorganism that is the bottom of the food chain. And basically all fish is starting with fight by eating phytoplankton or the small fish are and the bigger fish eat those so there's warming water has got a number of um, known and probably unknown uh, impacts and of course i mentioned before the the acidification which affects shell building and um, coral reefs and so forth um, so um, there's no clear answer to this problem as you, I'm sure, are well aware, the only kind of silver lining is that there's been a big movement, which is growing slowly, but it is a big movement to um, create maritime preserves. And um, there is, you know, especially large ones. Uh, and now about 8% of the world's ocean is closed to fishing and in industrialization. And there is some evidence that it does help fish adapt and um, better to um, climate change. But it's kind of a, um, at this point, a bit of a wish and a hope. Um, so let me stop there and see if you have any questions. And I apologize for, we didn't get our slides going um, because I had some very nice pictures to show you, but I hope um, the general ideas that I was, looking to convey have come across and if they didn't uh please ask me any questions you have thank you thank you nick i thought that uh you did a great job of really summarizing the book and and again i would like to say to everyone this is an incredible book uh the blue revolution hunting harvesting and farming seafood in the information age and it's, it's something that uh, I've been discussing quite a bit within my wildlife management class, uh, really referring back to, to maybe not as new an information as what you've been providing here. Uh, I'm going to see if we've got some questions. We do. And I will read those to you, Nick. Uh, so from April, for the carvin or carnivorous farmed fish like salmon or sea bass, where are they getting their food source from? Is it sustainable? Uh, excellent question. Well, this has been um, one of the big issues with some fish that I didn't mention, but I'm glad you brought it up. Um, farm salmon, uh, going back to the 90s, used to need, say, five pounds of fish food, i.e. food created from fish like anchovies or bait fish to create one pound of fish, of salmon. So it was basically like robbing Peter, the the ocean of its fish to pay Paul. And it was, it was kind of a, a bad deal and it got a lot of negative um, attention. Um, the thing now is um, they're closer. So that was like a five to one ratio for salmon in particular and I, other carnivorous fish, maybe not as, uh, um, exaggerated, but uh, in the last 20 years, they're closer and closer to a one-to-one -one ratio, and they're using more and more uh, non-fish fish food, uh, single-cell proteins, uh, soy uh, products. Of course, soy products also have a kind of a negative uh, re uh, impact, which is, you know, cutting down the Amazon to grow soy fields. Um, but so the answer is that um, there has been a concerted effort um, to, to create and um, non-fish fish foods. So you're not taking fish out of the water at five to one to feed 
um, farm fish. And um, and I think even in in some cases, I, I've heard there it's below one to one, so it's less than a pound of of food to create a pound of fish. Yeah, I think that is a huge success right there. Uh, Sarah was asking almost the same question, but uh, she's added a second one here. Have there been any improvements to limiting bycatch and or finding uses for bycatch rather than throwing back overboard? Hmm. Another good question. Well, um, the answer to that, are they finding other uses for bycatch? The answer, I believe, is not really because if you're a fishing boat and you have a quota for haddock, say, and your trawl pulls up a lot of cod, which you don't have quota for, you do not want to be caught with cod on your boat. So what are you going to do with it? You're going to throw it overboard. And so it's, you know, and mo bycatch often doesn't survive that. I mean, some probably does, but by and large doesn't survive that. So that is a huge uh, problem. And um, I don't know what the solution to it is, but um, it there really is no particular use for it. There was a famous um, character in New Bedford. I don't know if you've heard his name, Ra Carlos Rafael, who was known as the Codfather. He used to <laughs> catch a lot of uh, cod and call it haddock. So he found a use for it. He would illegally label it and resell it and all this stuff. But he ended up doing four years in jail. So, um, and there are now, you know, there are human obser observers on boats. They're now, they're putting cameras on boats so they can see when you're pulling up um, illegal bycatch. So um, that's a policy issue for all you avid um, scientists and environmental people to figure out. So Claire uh, says, hello, uh, I was wondering, lots of folks I know are allergic to shellfish or multiple different types of finfish. Does any of your research indicate an increase in allergies or other health problems related to eating fish that would affect the industry? Hmm. I cannot answer that. Now, these are very good questions. I, I cannot answer that. No, I am. Um, I I didn't look into that at all. I didn't hear people talking about it. Um, maybe one of them has a, more information to pass on. Uh, I do. I do. I can't answer that. All right. Fair enough, uh, Bobby. I'm sorry. I missed the first 15 minutes. I hope my question was not addressed. I have heard from oyster farms who use bays for their farms that pesticide runoff has started making bringing their oysters to adulthood increasingly difficult. Have you heard of this as an issue? Uh, yes. Yes. <clears throat> Particularly in farms, um, one in the Damariscotter River in Maine, which is kind of the epicenter of oyster farming in Maine, which is a big business. Um, it's got 15 or 20 farms on it. And when they have high rain, uh, rainfall and runoff, um, yes, there are pesticides and toxins that go into the water that impact the, um, uh, and kind of can ruin the, the crop. So that is a, that is a big problem. There's one, uh, farmer up there, Bill Mook, Mook Sea Farm. You should look him up. He's a very interesting and innovative and creative guy. And he's built actually a huge um, shed and tanks. So if there is heavy rain forecast, he will take his oyster seed and small, small oysters out of the river, put them into his tanks until the threat is passed and put them back in the water to grow out. But not everyone is doing that, obviously. But um, yeah, it's a it's a big problem and it's an increasing problem. And um, but so location is important. So you don't want to be right near the, you know, the edge of a on the shoreline of a river, basically, because you're too close to the runoff. And and Nick, I don't know if you can see my hat. 
I can see. I can't see what it says. It says Pemaquid Oyster Company. Oh, that's right down the uh, Tamarascotta, of course. Right, yeah. Uh, and, and actually, I, many of the people that you mentioned in your book, and I have another hat here, Maine Aquaculture Association. Oh, yeah, they're great. Uh, Sebastian Bell. Yeah. <laughs> so and, uh, back... Pem Pemaquid, uh, what's the name of that guy? I talked to him a couple Carter, times. Carter, Carter Newell. Carter Newell, yeah, right. So yeah. Carter Newell, I actually took a course with Carter Newell at uh, the Darling Center uh, on the Dam Riscato, uh raising uh, oyster seed and uh, did some explorations myself with a couple of partners. And uh, we... That's uh, what Bill, Bill Mook was there at the same time, I think. That, well, right. actually, Bill Mook is who provided the seed. Uh, right, and, got it. And Bill is one heck of an entrepreneur, uh, as as you you certainly rightfully point out in the book. And uh, uh, yeah, I it was like old home week for me reading your book about oyster farming oh, and mussel really? farming oh, in New England. Yeah, nice, <laughs> good. Yeah. We have uh, another question here from claire apologies if you answered this already in your presentation but what is the fishing industry doing about ocean pollution like microplastics aren't all the fish eating it well this is a huge concern um the answer to that is i don't think the fishing industry <clears throat> is doing much about that uh mainly because it's just a much bigger issue than the fishing industry can deal with. Um, whether all the fish are eating it, uh, I don't know, but I know it's a huge concern for people. And, um, you know, the only, the only positive thing is that, that, that um, the microplastics seem to be congregating in, in spots in the ocean. So they're kind of swirling together. So they're not necessarily everywhere all the time. Um, but this is another huge problem to address. Um, I've never heard of anyone getting sick from uh, eating fish with microplastics. That doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Uh, Phoebe asks, when fish are farmed, in what form are the youngest seeds added to the farms? In what form? Um, they are, they grow out and, you know, from seed to spat or whatever they're called, fingerlings, uh, in small, you know, warm kind of incubator-like environments, and then are slowly at, at, at certain ages or certain stages, they keep moving to bigger tanks with other fish and they try to keep them separate from larger fish because a lot of larger fish, even of their own species, will eat them. Uh, particularly true of barramundi, who are very carnivorous. Um, so yeah, they, they just go from seed to spat to fingerlin to um, uh, juvenile, um, from tank to tank usually kept with fish of the same size and same, you know, uh, feed requirements. And it's very, um, so that is all very um, well organized and formulaic and um, clearly thought through from the beginning. Uh, from Anonymous, what fish for eating impacts the environment the least? Hmm. Okay. Um, well, shellfish in general um, would be one. Um, so I guess you would like want to look at the most abundant fish. So you're not taking rare fish out of the water. So you look at, and that varies over time. Right now, haddock is very plentiful. Uh, pollock is uh, often the number one catch in the world. So pollock is almost always very plentiful. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I think 
I think the an so beyond that, I think the answer varies depending on um, which fish is most plentiful, and that changes over time based on fishing technique and also on what's popular. But it really is the it is what the local catch movement is the problem is, is it's what the problem that the local catch movement is trying to solve. And the issue that um, Sebastian, I mean, um, Barton Seaver, I mentioned about um, wanting the imported fish from around the world. It, there is the movement to eat, you know, local, wild, um, sustainable fish. Um, and that, by definition, in addition to shellfish, is going to be the most um, environmentally sustainable. Good, good. Uh, also, uh, are all types of farm fish safe to eat? Um, I believe so, but I don't think all consumers believe so. For instance, a lot of people are upset about antibiotics in fish, and that was a big thing with salmon in the 90s. And now these salmon farms are not using antibiotics. Um, uh, I was at a Barramundi farm, which I mentioned Um they only use antibiotics on a one-to-one -one -one basis when a fish has got some kind of clear infection as a juvenile or a, a fledgling. Um, so antibiotics by and large aren't used. And there's no harm from eating a fish that has been given antibiotics. The main issue with antibiotics, overuse of antibiotics is it reduces you know, um, global resistance to bacteria. So the more antibiotics are used, the more organisms or bacteria are resistant to it. Uh, but that is not um, a health issue per se. And Claire asks, do you happen to know diet-wise how fish compares to more typical land livestock as a sustainable protein source? In a previous One Health seminar, chicken eggs were shown to be most sustainable and how much resources it took to make versus how much protein they provided. Hmm, interesting. Um, well, um, if you look at the food conversion ratio, which I mentioned earlier, I mean, uh, beef and so forth can be six or seven to one grain to pound of meat. Um, chicken and pigs and so forth are less than that. You go down five, four, three, two, one, and so forth. But fish being one-to-one -one have, um, you know, a very high food conversion rate. Uh, the other thing is that fish um, don't take up land. They don't require crops to be grown on land. They don't take, you know, millions and millions of acres of land. Um, uh, fish live in the water. They um, they are not subject to gravity. They're very fluid. They can exist in all kinds of situations. So um, it's pretty hard to kind of compete uh, head to head with fish in terms of resource use. I would say you can. And, you're and shellfish are even better, right? Shellfish eat nothing. They just all they need yeah. is a source of water. Yeah. 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 Uh, but no fish need land really, except as I mentioned before, if you're growing soybeans to create fish food, yes. Um, but I think that even that has people are moving away from that. But uh, these are great. These are great questions. This these these people have been thinking this through. It's great. Well, and and you're getting a pile of questions here, Nick. So I'm really pleased to see this. Uh, so another question, uh, are farmed raised fish exposed to less mercury in the water than wild caught fish? Um, well, the answer is if they're in a, a, a tank, yes, because that's a very controlled circumstance. I mean, um, if they're raised in the ocean, they would be as susceptible as any other fish, depending, of course, on what they're eating for their fish feed. I mean, if they, I mean, the, the mercury would be coming from other smaller fish that are eating fish, but if you're not eating those smaller fish, if you're eating some kind of feed, then it would, you wouldn't be susceptible to the mercury. Okay. 
And April asks, do fish like other farmed animals have withdraw times for medications? Meaning um, that um, they're they're taken away from the herd to go I, into I think the it may be for if, if you've had bi antibiotic supply, do they have a period of time before they're harvested? Oh, for... yes. I believe they do. Yes. Yeah. All right. And then Claire has answering my own question. According to a 2016 <laughs> article I found on PubWeb, the prevalence of fish allergy ranged from zero to seven percent, and the prevalence of shellfish allergy ranges from zero to ten point three percent, depending on the method of diagnosis. Most studies rely on self-reporting surveys, so that's spotty at best. The limited data available suggests that fish allergy prevalence is similar worldwide. However, shellfish al allergy prevalence may be higher in the Southeast Asia region. Interesting, Claire. Mm. Uh, and uh, what percentage of farmed raised fish live in a tank versus the ocean? Well, that's going to be a hard one. Yeah, that's a hard <laughs> one because, yeah. Uh, I mean, the whole tank thing is relatively new. It started in Norway. Well, actually, no, let me let me take that back. It started in um, Europe in the 70s to grow eel because the Europeans love eel in these tanks on land. Uh, but it never really took off for other things. And um, then there was one started in Western Massachusetts in 1991. This is the Barramundi thing. That was the first one in the U.S. Um, and there's another one in Carolina, I believe, about the same time. Uh, but it was only really about 10 years ago in Norway that they started doing this with salmon. And that's now kind of engendered other fish tanks or farm fish and other tanks. Um, so... Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. If you, if you, I don't know how many actual fish are farmed in the ocean. If seventy percent of the aquaculture is seaweed and shellfish, you know, um, so I don't know what that number is. Um, but I would say there are more fish in the ocean, probably yeah. overall. Yeah. Well, we're, we're pretty much out of time, but I wanted to kind of finish up with a, with an observation of my own and see if you agree with this. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been talking with, with my wildlife management class uh, for a good portion of the semester about, well, we started out with talking about the loss of large terrestrial mammals in North America in the late 1800s that we essentially had unregulated harvest to meet a consumer demand that we had technologies that were being developed that actually helped to do the, uh, to do the overexploitation i have kind of compared that to global fisheries uh, especially earlier in the in the 70s into into the, this century as well uh, and that technology was really driving a good portion of that. We had too many boats uh, for too few fish and technologies making it possible to uh, get those to markets all over the world. But your book is is really making me feel that technology may be the saving grace here as well. Uh, mm. And that, you know, the United States has become a leader in showing how we can step back from the mistakes that we've made with the Magnuson Stevens Act uh, and try to correct that and constantly be doing adaptive management, uh, but also looking to the future as to how we can really feed the world. And and I would say at this point, aquaculture is maybe feeding more the the higher end incomes in our country rather than the poor um well that's in our country but in in um in asia and africa that's not that's right really tr right true uh but i i really think that uh, you've kind of demonstrated with your book that technology may very well be something that helps us and, well, and i think I'm probably here oh uh, you know muscles are probably the big thing that are that are getting down to 
most economic groups, right? Mm, right, right. Yeah, they're mm. much cheaper than oysters and more, you know, the, yeah, a, more abundant, really. So to your point, which is great, I, I agree with you. The only thing is, and I, I'm going to send you a slide because the last slide of my um, presentation, which I okay. didn't talk didn't talk about, compares the um, extinct land-based extinction over 10,000 years to maritime marine extinction over 10,000 years. And it's, you know, mar marine extinction is almost zero on the scale compared right, to terrestrial. Right, right. And it's because um, there has been less, you know, because we've used up so much land and hunted so much on land that we haven't done that in the ocean, even though we've done a lot. But to your point about technology, I think, yes, it is true. The only danger now is the possibility that the ocean might be industrialized. You know, there's all this, there's all these wind farms, sure. talk about mining, you know, um, minerals and elements for electric cars and so forth. Um, and who knows what else. So, and, and just fish farms. So there is a possibility that the, you're right that the technology is really kind of saving us in many ways, but the industrialization, which hasn't really started yet, could take off and be another kind of tipping point the way it has been on land. So anyway, I'll send you this slide, which is by August McCauley from Santa Barbara, USC Santa, Bar C, Santa Barbara. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting slide. Great. But, um, yeah, no, great point. I think you're. I think it's uh, well taken. And um, so, anyway, thank you uh, so much for um, allowing me to address your wonderful students who had great questions. And yeah. um, I am um, very impressed. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I will share the slide with, particularly with with our, uh, my class anyway. And there are a lot more people on here than that were just from my class. So you've you've had a great turnout. You've had uh, probably a record number of questions that we've had for our One Health seminars this semester. Mm. Nice. Uh, I think you've given us a whole lot to think about. Uh, it's unfortunate that we weren't able to get your slides up, but I think you did a great job of uh, summarizing your book. And I sure hope that uh, people will take the opportunity to uh, get that that discount from Island Press, 30%, if you just use webinar as the code. And I, uh, again, Nick, thank you so much. It's been a great presentation. Great. <clears throat> thank you. I'll be in touch. And if your students have any questions, just uh, shoot them over to me. I will. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Have a great night. Bye-bye.